So thank you for coming. This is Dr. Robert Bell's show. Healthcare, which we usually think of in this province as a cost. What we're going to talk about today is the concept of healthcare as an asset. And I think a crucial asset, not only to the way our society functions today in terms of a vibrant, publicly funded health system, perhaps more importantly, the impact that healthcare, publicly funded healthcare, and the academic health science model that we're going to refer to today, the impact that will have in the future in terms of the vibrancy of the Ontario economy. And the opportunity that some of the younger people, and certainly my children hopefully, will have to create good lives and earn good livings in Ontario, not based on what we're currently doing, which is the disappearing manufacturing sector and the, the service sector, but also the opportunity for the life science sector to drive some of our economic opportunities. And this serves not only as an opportunity for scientific discovery, but also as an opportunity for wealth generation. That's what I hope to have as part of the conversation later on this morning. We have two spectacular speakers for you. The first speaker is Dr. Jonathan Irish. Jonathan is the head of surgical oncology at Princess Margaret and University Health Network. He's an otolaryngologist and one of the world's leading otolaryngology cancer surgeons in the world. He uh, specializes in head and neck cancer in his, in his day job and in his administrative job, he tries to organize surgical oncology across the province. And he and Hartley Stern have done a spectacular job with organizing our services. He's not here to talk about the organization of cancer surgery today. He's here to talk about the next generation of how we actually do cancer surgery, how we provide better services to our patients, and how we develop here in Ontario, here in University Avenue, the technology appropriate to bring better outcomes to our patients through better care. So John's going to talk about something we're very excited about at UHN, image-guided surgery. John, over to you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Um, as Bob said, I, we, when we were sort of thinking about today's talks, we were talking about you know, the future of healthcare, and I could stand up here and talk about the fact that I don't think pay for performance is going to go away, and I think that access to care and access to quality care and access to safe care are always going to be part of the raison d'etre of, of pay for performance, but I thought today what we would do is step outside the box and really look forward to the future, at least as it applies to surgery, and specifically as it applies to surgical oncology or cancer surgery, five and ten years from now. And I thought I'd challenge us, all of us, you as administrators, to think about are we prepared to implement these new technologies in our workplace, in our research hospitals, in our hospitals for our patients. Bob mentioned about a shrinking manufacturing sector in the province of Ontario, but he also alluded to the incredible opportunities that we have in the health sciences enterprise that we have within Toronto, at the University of Toronto, and the ability to export this kind of technology. And which brings me to my first slide, which is I was giving a talk at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York uh, uh, in November. Um, our our faculty was giving a joint conference with the MD Anderson Hospital in Texas, the Memorial Sloan Kettering, and the Princess Margaret Hospital. And I went out into the lobby at one of the coffee breaks and I picked up this, this brochure. Sorry about that. I'm technologically challenged, clearly. Um, and you can see right here that uh, image guided radiation therapy. And you can see a new paradigm emerges for cancer treatment. Well, this is kind of interesting because this is a paradigm that we've embraced here in the province of Ontario and specifically at the Princess Margaret Hospital and within the GTA at our Sunnybrook uh, Hospital Centre as well as the standard of care. And in fact, this radiation oncologist was trained at the Princess Margaret Hospital. This technology, cone beam CT scan, which is acquired for uh, directing in, the, in a sense, IMRT, Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, was in part developed with our physics and science group at the OCI and was translated to 
to our radiation oncology group at the Princess Margaret Hospital. This is a great example of exactly what Dr. Bell was, uh, was talking about a few minutes ago, about our ability to look at opportunity in our healthcare sector for, for developing new technologies and exporting not just the technologies, but the minds to drive these technologies, the cerebral horsepower, if you will, to drive these technologies. And this occurred about eight years ago when we understood in radiation therapy that we were falling behind. That once the Princess Margaret Hospital was in the top 10 for radiation oncology centers in the world, and we were out of that top 10, and we're now back again. And because we understood the fact that we were falling behind, and we had to create an infrastructure and a co-structure for new therapies, new technologies. And so what I'm st standing here now is saying, now we have to do the same for surgery, surgical oncology, cancer surgery, and other surgical disciplines as well. Because quite frankly, we're fall we have fallen behind. We've under-resourced our surgical services in the province. In a sense, that's what the wait time process is all about, partially. It is recreating the resource, the human resource, and co-structure resource to deliver appropriate surgical services, cancer surgery services, hip replacement services, cataract services in the province, but link it to quality and innovation as well. So at the Princess Margaret Hospital and the University Health Network, like many of our University Avenue partner hospitals, we're branding ourselves not just as a health services delivery center, but as a research hospital. And one of the areas of, this, of the hospital where probably the concept of a laboratory or a research hospital is the furthest away is in the operating room. We don't think of our operating rooms as areas where we test, where we form hypotheses and test outcomes. We think of operating rooms as places to take care of patients. But in fact, it should be no different then trying out a new drug, a phase two or phase three trial for a new cancer therapy or for a new radiation oncology therapy system. So we need to create platforms in our research hospitals because our responsibility as an academic health science center is to lead, is to push the envelope, is to show the way for the next generation of surgical oncologists or surgeons taking care of patients. And so the GTX program, which I am a, a partner in leading, is really the platform from which we are thinking about delivering new surgical services to create and innovate, translate, and evaluate. And I'll explain more about that in a few minutes. But in a sense, to create a center for innovation and translational research in integrated image-guided interventions, a real mouthful. But in a sense, it talks about creating and innovating new technologies in a laboratory with our physics and science groups, where is a core program of our, of, our, of our physicists and science groups, which I'll talk about momentarily, to translate that to an image-guided operating room and to test out new technologies for delivery and targeting of cancer, cancer care. And what a good example of this is the concept that five and 10 years from now, the eyes, the hands, the scalpel of the future surgeon are going to be very different. Are we prepared to think about new technologies and evaluate new technologies under that proviso? The eyes of the future surgeon are going to be very different. They may be guided by image-guided therapeutics. The scalpel may be a laser, a photodynamic therapy, or even as Dr. Mack will talk in a few moments, a molecular guided intervention that may be delivered surgically. And finally, the hands that guide that scalpel may no longer be these hands, but be toggling a robot that will deliver the fiber optic, let's say fiber, uh, that will deliver a laser energy to a, to a tumor under image guidance. And I'll talk a bit more that, about that sh uh, shortly. So this is a great example of the technology that was exported 10 years ago and developed at Princess Margaret Hospital in collaboration with industry. It looks simple but it provides exquisite detail with regards to where the eyes of the future surgeon can go. Real time, not near time, not CT scan imaging that was taken five days ago, but intraoperative, real time image acquisition and guidance with tracking systems. And our physics group created this system for the delivery of radiation therapy. And quite frankly, it's a simple uh, system, which is 
a cone beam CT scan image which rotates over the course of 90 seconds to acquire a set of images. These images hopefully will show. The, uh, these images then rotate on the table so that you can see that these are the kind of images that we can get within a three minute reconstruction with 3D formatting. Both soft tissue, hard tissue, but merge that or marry that with tracking devices intraoperatively and you can see the exquisite technologies that you can appreciate. So no longer are we talking about minimal access surgery, although that's where we are now and these kind of technologies enable that kind of technology, but we're going to be talking about micro access and probably after Dr. Max talk, you'll even thought, think about nano access surgery. So this is the kind of technologies that we need to evaluate, translate, and uh, care for, new pa for patients with cancer. But part of the technology is to evaluate. So part of the technology is, that was a beautiful image to you, but is it accurate enough? Well, here's a good demonstration of that, and, and here is a, an example. I don't have a laser pointer, I don't think, do I? I don't have a laser pointer. But um, the two dots shown right there are the smallest bone in the human body. And that's the, the bone shown there. See the exquisite kind of uh, uh, resolution that we can appreciate within 90 seconds on an operating table. That's the kind of image accuracy that we can acquire intraoperatively. You merge that with tracking systems, and that's the kind of accuracy we need for tumor targeting. When we look at uh, models to target, one of the best targeting models is to target the cochlea, which is a one centimeter organ of hearing and balance in the middle ear, or the inner ear. And this is a system whereby we can target this exquisitely in 3D image technology. For cochlear implantation, we don't do co I don't do cochlear implantation in my practice, but we are going to partner with the Hospital for Sick Children. I'm talking about partnerships with the Mount Sinai Hospital for sinus surgery delivery. I'm talking about partnerships with Sunnybrook Hospital for cochlear implantation in adult patient populations. So our responsibility is to collaborate. Collaborate with other leaders in healthcare services delivery, collaborate with industry to create the technologies for marketing and development. And this is where the surgeon of the future needs to think about. I talked about the fact that this would enable minimal access surgery, and you can see that a small tumor in the midbrain uh, in the sinus just below the pituitary, where the eyes are uh, about a 0 0.5 centimeters away from the tumor and the base of the brain is uh, 0. Point, or 0 0.3 centimeters away from the tumor, you can appreciate the exquisite targeting that's required intraoperatively to minimally access that uh, tumor and resect that tumor accurately. And you can appreciate that on the operating table you can see the endoscope. Normally this is a, a tumor that would be removed with a wide incision, a large incision, removal of the mid-face bones and reconstruction, but sticking, quite frankly, a small three millimeter endoscope through the nose under real-time image access is a real benefit in being able to target this type of tumor. And we have the abilities to do this in archived imaging now. Brain Lab and many other industries and, and companies market these kind of technologies but no company, really, is doing this in real-time image guidance. And this is where our responsibility lies. It brings us to the next point of where the scalpel of the future surgeon will be, and where the hands of the future surgeon will be. Because it's one thing to see the tumor, but with kind, this kind of minimal access or micro-access ability to appreciate the tumor, the next step is to merge that with new technologies, new ablative technologies. And probably the best example, the best um, model for talking about minimal access surgery in cancer is in prostate. In a sense, the new paradigm of ther therapy, which is being developed at our center with our urology group, and John Trachtenberg is our leader here, merges image guidance, the ability to appreciate exquisitely the tumor, 
being able to merge that with image-guided surgery and ablative therapies, physical therapies, laser therapies, or high-frequency ultrasound ablation. So the scalpel is going to be very different. And rather, rather than a radical prostatectomy, removal of the entire prostate gland with side effects of impotence, incontinence, and so on, a focal ablation therapy, in a sense, a male lumpectomy, not dissimilar from the lumpectomy that we discussed in breast cancer years ago. Instead of the wide, radical mastectomies, we're now talking, and it's now standard of care, for a female to undergo a lumpectomy with radiation therapy. Not dissimilar. Less radical sur surgery, less radical ablation, focal ablation under image guidance with the kind of imaging that we can produce. But how do we do that? Well, we can merge this kind of uh, technology, this image guidance with high frequency ultrasound, or in this case, with laser. And part of the, the issue here is to understand the, the, the laser physics and, the, and the, the heat or physical therapy that's ablated by the laser. We have to appreciate the amount of energy delivered by the laser in the laboratory and appreciate the kind of necrosis around the, the, the target that's delivered so that we don't injure critical structures, critical structures like the urethra and other structures. But with this kind of technology, we are now we now have Trigger B, which is an experimental operating room suite, which is uh, under MRI scan guidance. We deliver a, a made in University of Toronto robot under fiber optic guidance with MRI scanning to deliver a fiber optic probe into the prostate under MRI scan guidance with ultrasound to ablate a focal area of the prostate where the prostate tumor is. And we've now accrued 10 patients with outstanding results. They're selected, it's not for everybody, but this is an example of where this technology is going. And this is an example shown on the, the MRI scan to appreciate the target, which is outlined in yellow. It's overlaid to an ultrasound to allow for intraoperative uh, guidance. And that's our target zone shown on the upper slide and our ablation uh, zone shown on the lower slide. And you can appreciate the kind of exquisite technology, marrying of technologies, marrying of image guidance, and focal physical therapy ablation to produce, rather than a radical prostatectomy, in a sense a male lumpectomy, where the patient's PSA levels, a measure of active prostate cancer, return to normal in all 10 patients. And this is an example of where these kind of technologies can take us. And in the future, the concept is going to be around tumors in motion. We have minimal access therapies for, for, th for, for lung cancer. In fact, we have screening programs to detect early cancers. CT scan, helical CT scan imaging to detect early lung cancer that is less than a centimeter in size. But how do we deal with that? Do we wedge out a lung? Do we wedge out a lobe? Well, our options now will include minimal access thoroscopic introduction of a small scope through the chest wall under image guidance, we will focally ablate that tumor under image guidance. With this kind of technology, our ability to image an organ in 3D, but in fact four dimensions, because the, second, the fourth dimension being time. This organ moves, we breathe, we can collapse the lung, which minimizes that, that movement, but the fact of the matter is we will still have movement. And that's the exquisite part of this technology. And this is where we are visioning a year and two or two from now. And finally, merging all of these technologies with the hands of the future surgeon. The hands will probably always be this, but they will be moving an articulated arm, probably at the end of a robot. And instead of a, a, a six centimeter, what is that, 20 centimeter hand, a 15 centimeter hand, you'll be having a one centimeter hand that may be moving a, a scalpel, a fiber optic rod, a, a needle, as I'll show you in a few moments. And that will toggle a robotic arm under image guidance. And we're thinking around placing transducers in those robot hands 
so that they are fed back to a cone beam CT scan for tracking purposes. That's, our, that's what we're thinking about as well. So we're not just looking at the robot arms, but we're, we're actually looking and toggling based on a real-time acquired image. I'm going to break out of this talk for a second just to show you, I hope, because I don't want to play the whole robot. This is work we're doing with the MD Anderson Hospital. And I just want to show you, so here we are at the base of the brain. I know it's close to breakfast. <laughs> but this is the kind of exquisite type of, here we are operating in the size of a penny. Okay? So this is the kind of ability of image acquisition that we can see with our eyes, and the kind of image acquisition that will marry with um, image-guided surgery as well. One of the hardest things to do at the base of the brain is to suture. And this is the kind of, you can see there's a small hole created from the dura here, but you can see this is work that's being done uh, uh, with our GTX fellow, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a few moments. But this is some of the hardest thing, this is one of the hardest things to do, to suture a one centimeter hole in the dura at the base of the brain. It's almost impossible uh, to do without a robot. But this is the kind of technology that we need to not just translate to patient care, but as a research hospital, we need to evaluate its efficacy. Judging by the speed of that knot, you're going to need some extra OR time, John. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to the next point. <laughs> Former surgeon, Dr. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> former surgeon, Dr. Irish. <laughs> so here is the future of operating room. The, the surgeon is actually sitting down at a robot console, moving a robotic arm, which may deliver a physical therapy to a tumor target under image guidance with a cone beam CT. And the, quite, the issue here as research hospital administrators, on University Avenue in particular, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that's what GTX, in a sense, is all about. It's about a, creating a center, a platform for collaboration, for collaboration with industry, for collaboration with other health science colleagues. But really, it's about the concept in a GTX lab to create and innovate that cone beam CT, how to put transducers in that robotic hand, how to merge that with some of the technologies that I've talked about, innovate and create, and then translate that to patient care, just as we do now when we're doing phase two and phase three drug studies in our operating rooms that are research operating rooms, triggers, translational research guided operating rooms under MRI scan guidance for prostate cancer and trigger B, cone beam CT scan and trigger A for lung and head and neck cancer, and trigger C at the Toronto Western Hospital, cone beam CT scan and MRI scan imaging for, the, for neurosciences and spinal oncology. And that's what we need to think about. So as Bob said, is this going to be more efficient? No. It's going to be slower. Is it going to re uh, result in uh, shorter length of stay for patients? Absolutely. Minimal access surgery has been here for a long time. Micro access surgery and perhaps someday nano access surgery will re even reduce that uh, waiting time or reduce that uh, stay in hospital even further. So my last slide really is that the cancer surgery team, the <laughs> cancer team of the future is going to be very different from what it was five years ago. It's going to include physicists, scientists, surgeons, interventional radiologists working together. And that's the platform of the GTX program. Yes, and administrators. Because quite frankly, these kind of operating rooms are going to have to be protected outside the operational 
ORs, where you're putting through the volumes in a sense to reduce wait times, and we can talk about that as well. But the concept here is it is protected space for research. These are research operating rooms. So that's, that is the concept of GTX. Thanks very much. Tax had about seven different careers that any scientist would be extraordinarily proud of. And I think the career that he's launched on currently as the director of the Campbell Family Breast Cancer Research Institute is probably the most exciting because this is a new career that tax bring to target opportunities for new drug development in cancer, for understanding how breast cancer and other forms of cancer actually function, and developing new therapies to counteract those cancers in people at an early stage. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming one of the world's great scientists, Dr. Tak Tak. I think it's Charles time, good time for me to ask for a raise. Yeah. <laughs> After that uh, flattering um, that I couldn't really kind of uh, stomach. Um, but, you know, he, he did say, uh, yeah, we are, I think we're number three now, except the number three most quoted lab in the world. But uh, um, I think number one was cold fusion. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I think it's, uh, it's I, I put this title in backwards. And what I have here is molecular, oops, sorry, okay. Where's the point? Okay. No point. Molecular targeted drugs, can we afford not to have them? Right? I had beginning say, can we afford them? But I now turn it around because you guys are the decision makers, and you think about it, okay? Um, so thanks to our, partly to the doctors that have given us such good health, and partly to the statin, the cardiovascular drugs, um, cancer rate has not really declined, the mortality, even though it's been going up. We've been winning the battle but then more of us get cancer because we live longer and we don't die of heart attacks as much as we used to. So this is not a, it's a challenge for us, of course. Um, and of course, there are you know, victories we can bring. Uh, this is uh, Lance Armstrong had this. He had testicular cancer. He had it in his brain. My God, you had it in your brain and you're not living. That's pretty impressive. And that was because a chemotherapeutic agent called cisplatin exquisitely killed testicular cells. But it doesn't, it does well in other cancers, but not so well. Because it's all about how much, uh, how many rats you're going to kill before you kill everybody at home when you fumigate the house. That's it's really how, it, you know, if you kill more people at home than rats, then all you, the rats, you can never. So that's the challenge we have. Um, so now, here is something, 32,000 Americans, nobody cares about Canadians, but 30,000 <laughs> Americans die of, uh, get pancreatic cancer a year, 32,000 die. Um, the only thing that we really do very well, um, well, very well. Uh, is a drug called gemcitabine that Malcolm Moore had tested in, uh, in from Eli Lilly that's doing well. It's just, you know, it just give people a few more months or a year or so. And the surgeons, like Dr. Irish, they do this Whipple, and there's a little bit kind of a glimmer of hope for one or two or three percent of the patients. Um, we have alarming situations. Uh, like a melanoma, uh, white males, white females, just shooting through the roof. Uh, so challenge continues to accumulate. Um, so about 30 years ago, molecular biologists come in and they start figuring out how the cells being wired or how the wire has gone wiry. And, um, and we now do, today know about how the cells stop cancer cell from dividing, 
how how the DNA repair is being messed up, and a very important thing is how the cancer cells do not call abandon ship when they should, because remember we are metazoans. In other words, we're a society. Our whole body is a society. We're not a protozoa. We're not a bacteria. Bacteria only wants to divide and divide and divide and divide. But we, as a metazoan, cannot have any single one of our trillions and trillions of cells take off and say, I'm doing this by myself. Because, and, and, and so what happens is, there are, when you ever step out of line, you actually do not have police kill you. You actually self explode. Now that's, that's a mechanism that we have inherited for hundreds of millions of years for metazoans, that means multicellular organisms, uh, how to handle the society. Now that's called abandoned ship. So, of course, the idea with now that we all know all this. How can we target only the cancer cells, or mostly the cancer cells? In other words, if we have missiles that, that can let into the house, which will only target tails of rats. Now, most of us do not have tails. But occasional people do have tails. But I hope that probably none of us in the room. Uh, but, but if it's only target tails, then wouldn't that be nice? Because you can walk around, your kid can walk around, your kids can walk around, your wife can walk around, your husband can walk around, and they just say, choo, 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 choo. and choom, hits the tail, boom, the mouse explodes. Right? So that's basically what targeted agents are. Right? Um, so where are we? Um, basically, that's what it's really all about. This is a, a couple of years behind time. But you can see the trend was that from the year 2000-2004, 4 to 1 ratio FDA has approved targeted drugs. The year 4 or 5 years before, it was 4 to 1 ratio. It was still chemotherapeutic agents. And in fact, as I move around to chemotherapeutic oncology and pharmaceutical companies, Lilly, Novartis, Merck, that I consult with, Everybody said, no more poisons. No, poisons work. They work very well. But we hit the wall. The future is in sharp shooting drugs. Missile that target the tails. Right? They wouldn't hurt us. Well, it does do to hurt us, but not help. So what do we do? Well, we first have to identify these targets. That's not easy. Because there are thousands of targets, and they are coming in different forms. And then we have to find out what is happening in mice actually is happening in men. So pathologists come in. Right? Then everything we're ready, we move in the pharmaceutical companies, the biotech companies, and then eventually with the clinical trials. Right? Uh, so the pursuit is a long, long road. And Sometimes it's seemingly in circles. Sometimes you have to kiss a lot of frogs. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the reason why. So this discovery is average at approximately. I, I was vice president of college at MJ uh, uh, for nine years. So I learned a little bit about this. So um, the, the, it, it, the research takes about five years to kind of finally say, all right, I think I'm going to put the cameras on this particular one because the biologists believe it. It, it works so well in mice. It, there's correlation in humans. But it kind of goes into preclinical animals. The cameras come in. They spend hundreds of millions. They have tens of millions of dollars. Clinical trials are extremely, extremely expensive. And the cost is $1.3 billion for a new novel drug. But can we not afford not to have it done? 
or can we afford not to have them? So that's the question you have to ask yourself. I'll see if these are a list of, people, of drugs that made it. Um, they're all kind of pretty much, um, interestingly, Gleevec in number three down there. And Novartis basically threw out because it didn't work. And then Brian Drucker in Oregon said, OK, why don't we work on leukemias? Leukemias, my gosh, you know. People don't make drugs for leukemias because it doesn't make sense financially. But $1.3 billion to make a drug to get a $200 million sales a year, you never ever recover your cost. Right? Well, lo and behold, it's now selling at $2 billion because they are cranking up the price. The cost of the number three drug is $50,000. And the patient never gets off it. Right? It's not a cure. It's just holding everything down indefinitely. Now, so you have to make the cost fifty thousand dollars to keep a chronic myelogenous leukemia patient alive for the rest of his life. Well, you have to make the cost how much it will cost if he's not on that drug. Hospital cost, other cost, bone marrow transplantation, blah blah. So, and look at the FDA approval time. 2.5 months, number two, okay? Gleevec. FDA basically, usually, it's like months and years. And this is, and the Gleevec also has other, every now and then, you know, they, once you get approved, you can try something. And this is, uh, this is GI stromal cancer tumors. You can see here the tumor. Uh, on, the, on, on August 16, 2000, and then uh, look at that. This is this. By the way, this is this is a tumor which is called indolent tumor. Nothing touches it. It just keeps growing until you kill the patient. Chemotherapy agents do not touch it, and then it's all gone. Ninety-three percent of these patients on this drug are still alive today, eight years ago when they treated. With no sign of the cancer coming back. Right. So, where's the future? Well, I think we have to be creative because, insofar as balancing the cost, you can come up with many different arguments of how much the patient's going to be on this drug, like Gleevec, for CML, $50,000 a year, how much it's going to cost otherwise. You know, the, you know, the cost goes on and on and on and on. Because you can say, okay, well, this guy is the CEO of, you know, Scarborough General Hospital. And that got paid three million dollars a year. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he's not there now. What would it cost? You know, all these kind of things. But let's try to be creative. Why don't we? So we got some of these drugs, like the drugs that um, that you know, some of these other drugs, are being approved that only affect 5-10% of the patients. If we can get them approved, that actually helps 50, 70, 80% of the patients, all of a sudden that cost comes really, really down. Right? Now, I don't know if the pharmaceutical companies would be happy, but FDA can step in and say, oh, you know, FDA is now approving drugs that are helping two months for 10% of the patients living two more months, FDA is approving it. That bar has to be go up in some ways. They can have maybe two tiers of approval. <coughs> approval for if you want to pay for it. Right? And so there is a lot of the cost. But now if we, we, we create it, we think of drugs that now normally narrowing, we only help people who have got green jackets in this room. So we can pick up the green jackets and instead of saying everybody wears a jacket. Right? So those are the kind of things. So now obviously creativity is something that you have like this little duckling is very brave. It just goes up and it goes up. Right? Um, that, that may be good, but, but then a truck can come and then duck, that's the end of the truck. <laughs> and this, this second duck, ready, I'm ready to go. Right? You look at the last duck, he's looking somewhere else. <laughs> That is the duck I want. The duck that is sleeping down here, uh, that one, don't come to my lab. Okay. So sometimes you have to look the other way. 
Okay, um, this is my all-time favorite Chinese painting. It was on my face screen for screen uh, safe screen saver for two years, and I never knew the title. I always thought, hmm, this is such a beautiful river, tranquility, village, house. You know what it's called? Because sometimes you stare at it for two years, you miss the point. What is really most important? This is called two swallows. See that two, two swallows up in the sky? Okay. This picture is called two swallows. So that's what sometimes science is about. It's about two swallows. I was in the University of Wisconsin last week, and the students say, what's the most greatest moments of your life? Was it discovery of T-series? Was it discovery of the P-10? Was it Olympic philosophy? Was it no. I said, two swallows. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> two swallows is, you, you, you're on the plane, and all of a sudden you say, be it an hour, a month, a year, 10 years, it finally dawned unto you that you've been looking at the wrong thing. That's science's problem. So here is an example. Today, billions and billions and billions of dollars are being poured into making anti-cancer drugs. All right? These are the six ways that cancer can come about and evade treatment. But on the top is oncogenes, killing, angiogenesis, metastasis, whatever. Look at the top. Almost all the drugs. All, oncogenes are genes that, that chicken and and, and, and mice viruses used to capture in the 70s when I was a trainee. I used to remember that. And why are we doing that? Because a long, long time ago, in a far, far land away, there were these oncogenes. I remember when I was a trainee at the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, on the front were all the cardinals. That all, most of them have gotten Nobel Prizes now for discovery. Howard Tamman, David Baldwin, Mike Bishop, you know. Harold Varmus, all important people, and, and it was all about oncogene. Oncogene caused cancer, block it, then that was the dream. Block oncogenes, everything is fine. You will cure cancer. So billions of dollars went in, right? And you go in here, RAS, the second one. There's an inhibitor that Merck and others have made for Abbott and YS, everyone had made. It's now been clinical trial for 20 years, and it has not worked. It's now being tried in leukemias. After, after $5 billion, you decided to pick up $40 million to risk, risk you know, rest. There, there is something wrong all of a sudden. Man. So this picture, that block oncogene cure cancer, I am actually starting to doubt it. Right? Why? Because if you only have a hammer, all you tend to see everybody think is a nail. We cannot get a grant in the 70s, 80s, and 90s to study anything else but oncogenes. Because the cardinals say block oncogenes cure cancer. Right? But that's the paradox. But the problem is oncogene kills cells. Little known fact. Because oncogenes are when engines are put on super high. It's like when your car goes down 401 at 200 kilometers per hour, Dalton McKinty make you put in a switch, explode yourself. <laughs> okay. It's been known for 15 years. Pharmaceutical companies haven't caught on yet. So that's why blocking oncogenes don't work. So it's not a, it's part of not seeing the whole picture. You see, those binoculars are capped. Take look carefully. They're not even open. Look how carefully. The cap's still on. That's what some pharmaceutical companies do. They say, well, let's just do it. Merck has one, I want one. Pfizer has one, I want one. Come on, think about it. Look at the picture. Not seeing the whole picture. So we try 
at the Prince Mario Hospital and the Campbell family. So we try to see the picture. We have a whole group of, I think, really smart people come up with ideas. We want to be that little duck looking sideways, not say, I'm going up there. They fight us down, murk down, because the trucks are coming, right? So as, um, as um, Bob was saying, we, we're delivering kind of like this particular clinical trials in, 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 in MD Anderson and Sloan Catering is to block the fuel that fuels Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay. Um, breast cancer is what we're trying to do here. Breast cancer is doing really well. You can see the mortality is going down, uh, even though 5,300 women in Canada still die. But the unfortunate thing is the number one killer of young women that hasn't changed for men is probably a car accident. Uh, so there is an extra soft spot in all our hearts for that. And to make things worse, the instance going up. Okay. So we're fighting again a, 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 a kind of a losing battle in some ways, but we're winning at the same time. Um, there is hope, because now we know breast cancer is not one kind of cancer. Again, it's like, like people in the room with different shirts. Don't treat all of us with different color shirts differently, right? So Dennis Lehman, a friend of mine for 25 years, 20 years ago made the observation that women with red shirts are more aggressive in their breast cancer. We got to find different treatment for the red shirts, right? And he developed Herceptin, which Genitech selling for a billion dollars. But what more importantly, it's saving lives, right? Now there you really make, can make the calculation. This woman, you've got extra 20% of these women living here. This is flattening out. The hazard ratio is going down. That means it's not prolonging. It is saving lives. These are young, aggressive women, breast cancer. They're aggressive breast cancer, young women. Okay. So there you can really make that, you know, to put that patient in for so many more years, and now you're saving the lives. You don't have to come back, just to check up every now and then. <laughs> that lucky 20% that, that this drug is buying. So uh, we're hot on the trail. We've got six new drugs going in that we're working on at the Campbell family with Dennis. Um, you can see here, Dennis there. He doesn't look very happy, but, but he really is happy. That's the way he usually looks, OK? Um, so now what I want to say is, we are also completely, with three people, uh, Lou Cantley at Harvard, Craig Thompson, and, and, and ourselves, are now completely thinking of something very, very different. And we just say, what do cancer cells eat? It's not very elegant, right? The, the farmers and the bishops and Baltimore and, and uh, Weinberg, these big cardinals say, hold on a minute, that was studied in 1929. Yes, it was studied in 1929 by Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg realized that cancer cells are addicted to glucose. And it didn't make any sense because each glucose in glycolysis only gives you two ATPs. And cancer cells burn 100 times more energy. So it gives you a truck that burns you know, like, uh, one mile per gallon, and normal cells burn. Volkswagen burn one mile, what you now, one gallon to 50 miles. So, so why would they almost be so wasting in, in the energy they're going to... So he had a theory that was wrong, but didn't matter. He actually received a Nobel Prize for that observation. Um, and in fact, that observation is being used today because cancers have burned so much glucose. Warburg, 1929, showed Big glycolysis, so you basically have the patient drink a glucose that cannot be metabolized. You label that and you see, look at that. Okay, you can pick up the patient. So the, the, the argument is it doesn't matter. Cancer cells need a lot of energy. It, it's, it's not getting that 36 ATPs that it goes with the Krebs cycle. Some of you may remember from your. And, and, but it is mostly exclusively at the two ATPs. So the argument is because so much is coming in, 
you can afford to take one bite of each apple and throw the rest away, but because apples are coming through the sky, you just bite one and throw it back. Okay. Right. So that's been going on for now. 30 years, what people believe. Wrong, 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 wrong. It turned out all this glucose is not for energy. It's for the building blocks. Nobody ever thought for 30 years. Is that, well, how could you drive cancer cells to divide? Okay, so what does that mean? You've got architect lined up, plumber lined up, carpenter lined up, electrician lined up. Nobody delivered the bricks and the wood. Oh, no cancer. No new building blocks for the new. Nobody thought of it for 30 years. Then two, three, four years ago, the three of us got together and we said, let's tackle this problem. Let's deprive them of their building blocks and deprive them of the energy. It doesn't matter. You can have all the electricians, all the plumbers, all the communists, all the architects lined up. Nobody delivered energy. Nobody delivered wood. Nobody delivered bricks. So that's where we are right now. You can see here, actually, if you look very carefully, there are lots of cancers, 30 to 40%. You cannot detect glucose coming in. You can see here, right? And so what I'm trying to say is traditional can treatment kills the cells on the outside, but the inside, where there is no oxygen, there is no glucose, <coughs> what are they burning? If they're burning 100 times more, so, Katrin Zhao, who is a radiation oncologist from Switzerland, worked with me for five years and figured it out that they're burning a very special kind of fat. In fact, they're burning the kind of fat that only brain cells burn, that only cancer cells have. And it's called CPT1C. You might see CPT1C, this one in the middle. The only place you find it normally is in the brain. But cancer cells decided to hijack the brain's machinery, which is good because drugs don't get into the brain by and large. Right? So, and we'll go to Ming Chao, a pathologist, and say, now this is, a, this, this is a fatty acid burning pathway that is only found in the brain. Is it found in lung cancer? 84%. Lung cancer is taking the brain's engine to burn fuel. Okay? And so it looks like that's where all the ATP is coming from. Because one fatty acid gives you 146 ATP. But it's a special secret channel that cancer cells have hijacked the brain form of the fatty acid burning. Which is again good because drugs don't go into the brain by and large. So here it is actually the proof that if you deprive them of this, Cancer cells crash in six hours because they're just like a truck going down 401 at 110 kilometers, and all of a sudden you pull out the gas tank. Right? Books might keep going. <laughs> right? So, and if you block that, tumors don't grow as fast. And so we put seven cameras on it. These are true cameras. These are cameras from Aventus, Amgen. And we now have a drug that's 21 nanomolar. And this is under the guidance of Homer Pierce, who developed gem cytobin at AI Lilly. Wow! <laughs> and you put that drug in the animal, the tumors here don't grow. Right? So that's really surprising. So we have other things. This is my last slide. Um, um, we have um, Norman Boyd uh, discovered that mammograms that are high density, very high incidence of breast cancer. We're trying to track why, what are the genes involved? Are there treatments that are non-invasive that can block that? Say one in four, one in twenty. And so I've always been asked. I hope everywhere I go. Sometimes they say, "We're in Canada. Why? Why do we? Why do we? Why do we bother with doing research when Americans are spending 50 times more energy 
and money to, to develop science. So here it is. The whole world is continuing, contributing to medical research, and there is a sense that we in Canada should do our part. We are proud of what we can contribute to the world. And who said that? I said that. <laughs> past time, but Bob, thank you very much. Obviously, you, you, need, you need to come back with some of these individuals. Not only the great surgeons, great scientists, great researchers, but great storytellers. What a wonderful combination. Thank you so much for coming to Breakfast with the Chiefs.